This is the synthesis of a fluorescent natural product, a pre-lab video from the Organic Chemistry Lab sequence. The uh, protocol can be downloaded from the uh, course website on Moodle. So a quick synopsis of this lab. We're going to do a reaction called the Peckman condensation to make a compound called 4 methyl umbelliferone, which is a fluorescent uh, pH indicator. So we're going to make that, and then we're going to recrystallize it from ethanol and water, and we're going to test the fluorescent properties of different pHs. So by now we've become expert at many organic chemistry skills, and so this one we're going to be making fluorescent compounds. Uh, everything else we're doing reinforcing things, we're running reactions, filtering thing, and, and characterizing compounds, but and disposing of the waste safely. Safety concerns with this lab are, are pretty minor. Resource and all is not uh, the best thing, so I would try not to eat it uh, or stick it into any uh, open bleeding wounds or anything like that. But that's probably a good uh, good guide for almost anything in life. Okay, so we haven't really talked much about fluorescence. So we talk a lot about UV absorption, but fluorescence is sort of a different species, and it's basically the ability to emit light after excitation by another wavelength of light. Now this is, a lot of people use the phrase glow in the dark. Well, that's not entirely true. That's more phosphorescence, which is sort of a, a slightly different thing because fluorescence happens at a much faster time scale than phosphorescence. Um, and so what will happen is almost immediately after excitation, you'll have emission. And that emission is usually at a, is at a different wavelength than the excitation. So what happens then is because of this, um, which you'll learn about analytical chemistry, fluorescence is an extremely sensitive technique. So we can build extremely sensitive fluorescence detectors, and that's why it's so valuable. So fluorescence spectroscopy can measure very small amounts, even single molecule type uh, events. And fluorescent microscopy can be used uh, all over the place. So here's a picture of, a, I think it's a some sort of ganglion cell um, and all of its effectors with these fluorescent tags. So fluorescence microscopy is a huge new component of doing various kinds of biology. Now the molecules actually fluoresce have certain properties so um, a lot of the small molecules there's a whole other group of proteins called fluorescent proteins which um, are often used in biology but if you're looking at small molecules and, and really it's true for fluorescent proteins too it's just a little bit more complicated um, this, there's usually some sort of large conjugated pi system and there are hundreds of different what we call fluorophores that have different structures that mainly involve some sort of conjugated pi system. So one of the things that people have done is figured out how to attach these things to various kinds of other biologically important molecules and use them as tags. And so what you can do is, is then use this fluorescence either in spectroscopy or, you know, or in, in microscopy uh, to visualize a lot of different things. So this is a huge field of Bioconjugate chemistry is what we call it, or conjugate chemistry. This is what I do. Uh, so this is a pretty popular thing. So anyway, um, so here's just three fluorophores, um, and you can see that you can adjust the light by uh, the the frequencies and the wavelengths that you have. Um, so fluorescein is sort of the king of, of the fluorophores because um, one of the first ones has sort of a green light when it's excited by. Most of these are excited by some sort of UV light. Um, but there's some other cool ones. There's one called Lucifer Yellow, which I think is kind of cool. It's this nice yellow color. And then there's Texas Red. There's there's a hundred of there's hundreds of them. If you look online, you can buy a lot of them. And you know some of them usually they're not too useful unless you also then attach them to something else. Um, but there's been lots of companies that do that for various places. So you can get all these different colors: blue, reds, oranges, and they all have sort of slightly different things. So then you can use two or more at once and see it. So uh, it's pretty cool. Now the reaction we're going to do, we're going to be making one of the simpler fluorophores. It's actually not used that much because it's just not super intense. So we're going to make one called 4-methyl umbelliferone. And so it's a really easy reaction. It uses resorcinol and ethyl acetoacetate. Ethyl acetoacetate is something we've seen before. It's used a lot in, in clays and, you know, it has its own sort of set of, of enolate chemistry. Surprisingly, we don't use enolate chemistry uh, in this one. So we do this coupling. Uh, it has no solvent. Ethyl acetoacetate is a liquid. Um, and then we'll recrystallize it from ethanol water. Uh, and we're going to use DAWX, which is a bead that gives off acid. So there are, uh, this, this reaction, the Peckman condensation is really, we're not going to go over the mechanism, that's actually one of the questions. Um, so the question then is, is there are three reactions we actually already know, it's sort of stepwise. So the first is a transesterification, I guess that's a little typo there, uh, to replace the ethyl group with the phenol, and then electrophilic aromatic substitution to make the ring uh, onto one of the ketones is, is the electrophile, uh, the ketone carbons, and then a dehydration that gives the double bond. So, you know, the lab itself is pretty straightforward. So at the end of the lab, we'll isolate the solid. Um, 
we'll put about 20 MIGs in each of the three test tubes. Um, and then you'll, uh, after you get it, uh, while it's still wet, you can add it. And so we're going to have three different test tubes with three different kinds of, of solution. One water, one 10% HCl, and one 10% sodium carbonate. So you're going to see the pH dependence. Okay, and you'll see maybe you'll have to speculate then on the post lab why, how change in pH can result in different colors. And then uh, we'll have a little UV lens for you to see. And then we'll also get the solid at the end. Uh, we'll let it dry for at least a day, get the mass, and that'll allow you to get percent yield. In terms of waste, uh, let's put the solid waste in hazardous solid waste, and liquid can go down the sink with water.